Hi everyone, my name is Matthias and I'm going to show you how to prepare a simulation in virtual wind tunnel to be simulated in Ultrafluid X. And afterwards we will post-process the results using Hyperworks CFD. So let's start in virtual wind tunnel by loading our surface mesh. For that, go to file, import, and then choose your mesh. And for this recording, I will use the uh, geometry of the Too Fast Eco team from the Technical University of Munich, which kindly uh, lets us use their car model from 2019. This is a model that uh, was uh, built for the Shell Eco Marathon. So it's uh, a car that drives very efficient for um, pretty low speeds. So this is a simulation in for 10 meters per second. Okay, so when you load up virtual wind tunnel for the first time, it will look like this. And to show these uh, windows that I just closed, go to view and choose the model browser and the property editor. The model browser gives an overview of all the components in this simulation, which is obviously the car, but also the reference system and the later um, things like the wind tunnel itself or um, section cuts and all the other things that we define here. In the property editor, you can always um, edit these properties of all these um, objects. So if you want to hide or show things, you can simply click on that icon or right click and hide. Okay, so uh, I have shown the global references here to check if the car is centered, which it is. And also we need to check the size of the car to make sure that we didn't export it with the wrong units. So for that, click on measure and then on the component. In this case, it says 2.5 meters, which is the right size for this car. Next, the last uh, thing to check for the geometry is the normals, which you can do here. And now it shows the whole car in red, which means that all the normals are pointing outwards. If there was a normal that was pointing inwards, it would be shown in blue. And to reverse the normal, you could simply click on it and uh, virtual wind tunnel would automatically uh, reverse the normals or part of the geometry that was the wrong way around, so to say. Okay, but in this case, uh, there's no bl blue part on the car. So this is a good surface. And we can start by defining the wind tunnel. For that, just click on Edit Tunnel. And it will automatically create a wind tunnel of uh, a reasonable size. And for the width, I'm going to reduce it a little bit to 20 meters. The length is fine. And the height can also be reduced a little bit to 50 meters. If you're not sure how, how big uh, the domain should be, it's recommended to have five car lengths in front of the car, 10 behind the car, four car length to each side and six car length uh, in height. But that's just an, an estimation or a rule of thumb. Uh, you can always make it a little bit bigger because the, vortices, uh, the voxels that are on the edges of the wind tunnel are really big and don't take much computational power. Okay, so if you want to change any values that you have done here in the viewport afterwards, you can just click on the object in the model browser and then in the property editor, all these properties will be listed. So in this case, we can now change the inflow speed to 10 meters per second. Okay, so the next feature, we can now hide the wind tunnel. So the next, uh, the next step would be to identify the different parts of the car. As you can see in the model browser, this car is um, split into four parts, so chassis and four wheels. 
if you click on identify parts, you can now um, define the wheels, for example. So for that, just click on create wheel and select all the four wheels. To exit a tool like this one, just right click and drag the mouse to the left or click on the check mark. And now you can see that the wheels were identified by wedge and wind tunnel and also the direction and axis of rotation was automatically uh, defined, which looks right for all wheels. Okay, now you can also see that the wheels have a different icon next to them, which is a wheel icon now. So um, you also have the choice to set up heat exchangers and fans and body. But by default, every part is defined as a body. So for example, we don't need to define the chassis now because it's already a body. If you have wheels that are not rotationally symmetric like these ones, you have to create a moving reference frame, which is a rotationally symmetric geometry that includes all the non-symmetric parts. For example, if your wheel has spokes. And then this volume, the moving reference frame, can be defined by clicking the icon behind this wheel icon. The same goes for radiator, uh, for fans. And if you want to define a radiator or a heat exchanger, you have to um, import the heat exchanger in three parts. So the inlet surface, the walls, and the outlet surfaces have to be separated. And then you can just click on in and the part, this wall, and click on the part, and out and click on the corresponding part. And then your heat exchanger is, um, is defined. In this case, this car does not have any heat exchanger, but for example, for all of you that want to simulate for many student cars, this feature might be really useful. Okay, so next go to mesh controls, where we can define the refinement zones or the voxel sizes of the volume mesh. So since this is a lattice Boltzmann solver, the volume mesh is divided into cubes that are parallel to the coordinate axis. And for every refinement level, the cubes or the cube length, the edge length gets cut in half. So it's essentially, if you start at refinement level zero, which is the far field size, um, and the, which is refinement, yeah, refinement level zero, and then go to refinement level one, one cube will be divided into eight cubes. So let's define the far field size. Uh, this uh, standard value of 0 0.192 is uh, really good. We will use that one. And then we can um, create boxes around the car for further refinement zones. For that, uh, select the tool and then select the part that you want the box to go around. And now it shows the level, the so refinement level and the element size. So for refinement level four, it will result in an element size of 12 millimeters, which is uh, the one we are using here. And if you click on plus, we will just create the next one. So we will create a few of these up to refinement level one to have a smooth transition from refinement level zero, so the far field, up to refinement level four. And also we can see that these reach only to the bottom of the car. So actually, if you show the wind tunnel, we forgot to move the wind tunnel. You can do that either by choosing the move tool here or because we want to have the exact right height, I'm going to use the um, property editor and select C min and set it to zero, uh, minus 0 0.2. Seven four meters. Now the wheels are overlapping a little bit with the floor, which is what, what you want to have to be realistic because there will be a surface patch. And also it makes it easier for the solver to define the, uh, the volume mesh. Okay, 
Now we can also select these boxes and move them downwards. And they also can just uh, intersect with the wind tunnel. If they are overlapping, uh, they will just be cut off at the bottom of the wind tunnel. So let's adjust the sizes of these boxes. So box one, we want a height of 1.5 meters. For box two, I want 1.8. Box three, maybe 2.2, and box 4, 2.6 meters. And then because we, uh, the wake of the car is more important than the area in front of it, I'm also going to move these boxes a little bit downstream. Okay, so that looks good to me. Let's hide the wind tunnel and these refinement boxes and continue by setting an offset control. So these offset refinement zones uh, are defined by the distance between the surface of the body. Um, so for example, you can set the distance to 0 0.72 meters for refinement level 5, which will result in 12 layers of a uh, voxel size of 6 millimeters. And then we're going to click on the plus again to create another one for refinement level 6 with a distance of 0 0.025 meters, which will result in 8 layers of 3 millimeter voxels. At this refinement zone that's closer to the surface will override the other one. So essentially we will have eight layers on both of them because the first four layers of refinement level five will be divided into two, uh, eight layers of refinement level six. And then to investigate or to um, get better results for the wake of the wheels, we're going to create a custom refinement zone. So Virtual Wind Tunnel offers the feature to create geometry inside of Virtual Wind Tunnel, for example, for this purpose. So uh, we need a, a reference where we can place the sketch for the geometry. For that, I'm going to use the global Z axis. And then uh, go to Sketch, New Sketch, and select this surface. So now we can just simply draw different shapes, and I'm going to use uh, this polyline. And we can just draw a refinement zone that's around about where we uh, expect the wake of the wheel to be. So this is a first simulation. Um, later on, if we have the first results, we can uh, refine the zone a little bit and adjust it to be a better matching for the actual flow. But for now, we don't know how the flow will look like. OK, so if we're done creating a sketch, we can go to Geometry and select the Push-Pull feature to create a 3D surface out of the 2D sketch. Okay, now to also have the other side, we can simply mirror it. And then to have one object instead of two, just for better control, we can also use the Boolean feature. So Boolean, combine, and select these two. Now we have one part, which we can rename to refinement. So on wheels. And now we can switch back to Ultrafluid X. Go to Mesh Controls and Custom and select this custom volume 
as a refinement zone. Uh, and we want to for it to have level five. Okay. So here you can see you now all the refinement zones that we have and the two offset refinements that we specified. Okay, now the next step would be creating a material. Um, virtual wind tunnel has a material by default, which is basic A material. We will use this one for our simulation, but in case you want to create your own material, you can do that here and type in all the settings for density, viscosity, temperature, and so on. Then virtual wind tunnel also offers to use a belt system, like you will know from real world uh, wind tunnels, which is very useful if you want to compare your simulation data to actual uh, experimental data you got from a wind tunnel experiment. It offers to have a five uh, point belt system, but you can also uh, delete belts. For example, if you just want to have the center belt, you can delete the belts around um, around the wheels or under the wheels. In our case, we want to simulate uh, real world conditions, so or track conditions. So we are not using the belts, and instead we are going to set the whole floor as a moving floor. So the next uh, step would be creating outputs, for example, probes and section cuts and so on. But we're going to skip this step for now and define the run properties first, so we can know some important values for the output. For this run, you just uh, click on the play icon. And here you can define the name, the number of GPUs uh, you're going to use, and the path where the files will be exported. Also the inflow speed, which we already set, and then the runtime, I'm going to let it run for five seconds. So five seconds physical time. And you can um, use time step scaling. So time step scaling essentially can uh, increase the time step size, which means that you need fewer time steps to reach your runtime. Uh, this is possible as long as you're far in the um, incompressible area. So in our case, we are going to use a um, maximum velocity factor of seven, which then results in a scaling factor of about two, which means that our uh, time step will be about twice as big as for um, as defined by default. So because this is a car that drives in uh, in low velocities, it's possible to use this one. Um, you could even increase this factor to speed up the simulations even more. But to be sure, for the first simulation, I would use a low value. Or if you have a car with more uh, higher velocities or more aggressive aerodynamic setups like wings and so on that um, accelerate the flow very much, then I wouldn't. I would uh, disable the time step scaling and just use the default time steps uh, size. As a material, we're going to use air, and the simulation mode is set to aerodynamics. You could also uh, investigate the fan noise. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, we are going to use uh, moving ground. Obviously, we want the wheels to be rotating, and we want a uh, mesh preview to be exported. So the reason why I um, set these values before creating the output or defining the output is because now uh, we set the runtime and the time step scaling so we know the number of steps uh, time steps that our simulation will have which is in this case about 8000 so now when defining the output we can choose if we want to have probes on the surface or in the volume which, which is again very useful for comparisons to real wind tunnel experiments we can define section cuts or define surfaces or volumes for which we want to export the values um, independently so by default the volume of the whole wind tunnel will be exported 
and the whole surface of the car will be exported. If you want an additional export of a certain surface, for example, one wheel or something, you can choose it here, or you can choose a volume that you want to be exported separately, uh, which is very useful um, if you want to investigate, for example, the flow in the wake of a wheel, then you can define a volume and the, um, the data size of that volume will be much smaller than the whole wind tunnel, which makes it easier to process in post-processing and also just handling the data. Um, in this case, we are just we are not defining any surfaces or volumes because we are just going to use the default settings. And also we don't need any probes. For now, we will look at section cuts only. And so if you click on the icon, you get the choice of all three coordinate axes. If you click on it, there will be uh, this, a section cut will be created. You can choose the iteration for which one the first section cut will be exported and the output interval. So this is where our knowledge of the time steps is important because we know that our whole simulation will have about 8,000 time steps. So in this case, for me, now it's enough to just export one time step out of 900. So we are not going to have 8,000 results, but just a few of them. And this doesn't affect the averaging. So the average uh, values at the end of the simulation will still include all of the time steps. This is just about uh, the output size of your data. OK. so. Uh, we can create some more section cuts, for example, in this plane. And if you click on this icon here, that's the move icon, you get this interface to drag the surfaces and, and position them correctly. If you click on this play icon, it will um, apply all your settings and restart the tool so, can, so you can right away create the next section cut. So I'm not going to show you all of these. Uh, I have done them separately for the simulation file because you know now how it, uh, how it works and there's no need to uh, set all of them. But it's obviously recommended to create a lot of section cuts to have a lot of data for the post-processing. And as with the other objects, there's always the choice to um, edit the settings in this um, in the property editor. So here we can set the frequency, uh, the output interval to 900. All the section cuts. And also you can increase the size, for example, for the center one, it's very useful to have it a little bit bigger to get more uh, information about the wake of the car. So we're just going to increase the height to two meters and the length to five meters and move the center a little bit backwards, maybe to 1.5 or 1.3 meters. And move it up a little bit, a little bit to about 0 0.7 meters, maybe even less, 0 0.6, okay. So if you have created all your outputs, then um, yeah, you're basically done. And you can export your simulation. So for that, I go again to the play icon here, where we have uh, made these settings, and then um, click on export. This will export all the settings you have done as an XML file and also your car geometry as an STL file. And this car geometry is linked to the XML file um, by a reference in the XML file. So then click on export. And this is how it will look like. So um, you will get a UFX simulation folder. And because I already ran the simulation, there's an output folder. You wouldn't be able to see that after exporting. You will have this history file, this XML file, and the STL file. And these two 
are the uh, files that the solver needs. So these two are the files that you're going to upload to your workstation, which is then going to compute it. Now we're going to take a look in the XML file. And as you can see here, all the settings that we have done is inclu are included here. So this is the reference to the source file, to the um, surface mesh, the inlet velocity, the number of iterations, the Mach factor that we set to about two, um, settings about the air, about the uh, refinement boxes, the wheels, for example, here you could change the rotational axis of the wheels. So, or you can change which, um, which data you want to have exported. For example, if you know that you don't want to have the time average pressure, for example, then you could set uh, this here to um, false or where is it here? And then it won't be exported. So here, this, this file includes all the settings you have done in virtual wind tunnel and even more. So you have a little bit more details. For example, um, you could also rotate section cuts here. As you can see here, it's set to the X direction one. So the normal is in X direction, but you could also rotate it a little bit in case you want to have some more uh, special section cuts. Okay, but if you don't want to change anything, you don't even have to look at this file. You can just take the STL file, an XML file, and upload it to the cluster. And then the simulation is started via uh, a terminal, which we're going to do now. So I'm logged in into the workstation that I'm going to use. I already sourced the bash RC, and now I'm going to sort uh, the environment for Ultrafluid X to have the right commands available. which is at um, my location of Ultrafluid X. And then in the scripts directory. And it's called set UFX environments .sh. Now I'm going to the folder where uh, I uploaded uh, the simulation. Here. And as you can see, there's the XML file and the STL file. Okay, now we need to export uh, the indexes of our graphics cards. It tells Ultrafluid X which graphics cards to use on the workstation. In my case, I will use um, eight graphics cards with the uh, number zero to seven. So uh, the command is export CUDA underscore visible underscore devices. Okay. And then we can use the launch command to actually launch the simulation. Um, the command is launch ufx standalone.sh. You have to um, to type in that comment while you're in the directory where the XML and STL file is located. So next you have to uh, type in the XML file. Uh, sorry, you not type in the number of GPUs plus one. So I'm using eight GPUs and so I'm going to type in nine. And then the name of the XML file, then minus O to specify an output. And then just the name of the output folder you want to have. Okay. So now the simulation is launching. And it says terminal output is recorded in this file. So we can just tail minus 100f to follow the last 100 lines of the file. And then the name of the file. Now you can see what Ultrafluid X is doing. So it tells you which XML file it's using, which SDL file it's using, some specifications for the domain size, the number of GPUs, 
and for example, your projected front surface. So now it's meshing our volume. And uh, yeah, this takes a little while. Okay, so now the meshing was completed in about a little bit over two minutes. And now we can see the amount of voxels that we have. So this simulation has about 22 million fluid voxels, uh, which is not very much for such simulation. And um, for formula student cases, for example, it can go up to about 200 million, um, which then in return obviously will take a little bit longer uh, to compute. And you can also see the amount of uh, fluid voxels in these different refinement levels. And as you can see, the highest refinement level, so the smallest voxel size, has by far most of these uh, voxels, which means that if you would uh, add another refinement level on it, which I would recommend just uh, to test if the result is any difference, uh, uh, different, then it will increase even more. So now it's writing the mesh preview, which we will have a look at uh, after this, just to check if our mesh is watertight and if the simulation ran correctly. So after uh, writing the mesh preview, Ultrafluid X will start um, computing the actual time steps of the simulation. Okay, so now as you can see here, uh, if I find it okay, so the exporting the mesh took another about two and a half minutes, and now it started uh, running the simulation. So as you can see in this line, uh, the time step currently is ten. And you can um, observe the values, the, the coefficient on the x, y, and c. And uh, it gives an estimate on when the simulation will end. So for this one, it estimates the simulation to run for another four and a half hours. And to get a better ex uh, estimation, I recommend you to wait for about time step one or 200. Um, so this will probably decrease a little bit to about for hours and 15 minutes. Okay, but as I told you, I've already rendered exact simulation. So we can now look at the results. And for that, we're going to use Hyperworks CFD. To import the results, just click on import results. And then you will get this output folder and it looks like this. So you have a summary file which includes the most uh, basic information, which is uh, yeah the time, the amount of fluid voxels, the graphics cards that you use, and the memory uh, usage, and how long the simulation ran. So it ran for uh, 16,000 seconds. And you will also get the averaged aerodynamic coefficients. So in this case, it uh, has a drag coefficient of 0 0.37, which is more than expected. So this simulation definitely is not uh, refined to the, to the best possible option. So you have to add more refinement levels or refinement zones in important areas. And now in Hyperbox CFD, we're going to look uh, at where to use these refinement levels or where it's best to place them. So you have in the export files coefficients data, which is essentially just um, the coefficients for every time step if you want to check if your simulation ran for long enough. So if these coefficients uh, converged, you have the full data, which is the volume or um, all the fluid quantities saved for every voxel in the whole volume, which are really big files. Then the mesh data, for the mesh preview that was just exported in the simulation, the section cuts, and the surface data for the surfaces. Also, there's a solver deck, um, the specified one, which is exactly what we uploaded, and then an effective one, which might be slightly different to the specified one because for some things, uh, Ultrafluid X has certain rules. For example, 
um, the wind tunnel size needs to fit a multiple of four voxels. So if your wind tunnel had not that exact size, it might have increased the size in the width or to the top a little bit. But usually there are um, no changes or just very slight changes to the specified solver deck. Okay, so let's start by checking the mesh data to check if our uh, um, surface mesh was watertight. For that, we load in the .case file of the mesh preview. And um, the interface of Hyperwork CFD is very similar to a virtual wind tunnel. So again, on the left, you have the um, object browser, where we will see the files in a second. OK. So here you can see the surface, which we don't read right now. We need the parts, which includes uh, the mesh, the volume mesh. So this is similar to the full data, but uh, this does not include any uh, results from the simulation. It's just about the um, the setup that we gave Ultrafluid X. So if we use the slice planes tool and slice it through the center. and uh, display the rotating variable from minus one to five and hide again the whole volume. You can now see that you get this picture. So this is uh, colored according to values. Um, maybe we can show the legend. Yes. OK. So uh, it's a little bit small, but um, so dark blue means a value of minus 1, blue 0, light blue 1, and then obviously up to 5 for red surfaces. So these numbers uh, tell you which boundary conditions were set at certain areas. So for example, um, the car is colored in dark blue, which means it's a solid. And the fluid is colored in light blue, which means this is the fluid. Um, if it looks like this, the, uh, that means that your surface mesh is watertight. So in this case, the simulation run um, or the setup was correct. So there was no fluid reaching into the car, which means uh, that we can use the surface mesh as it is, uh, as it is and we don't need to adjust anything. OK, so that's enough, enough for the mesh preview. We can delete it again to increase the performance a little bit and then start importing uh, the other outputs. For example, section cut. So section cut one uh, in this case was the section cut through the center of the car, as you can see here. And now it doesn't have any colors. So we can just right click on fluid volume, edit. And here you have, here you can choose uh, the colors of the surface, of vectors if you want to show them, of contour lines, uh, of the wireframe, and the outline. And these are not exclusive, so you can show the surface and the wireframe, for example. And if you click on the wireframe, you can see how this refinement looks like. So closest to the car, this is refined level 6, 5, 4, 3, and so on. And here you can also see the refinement we have done for the wheels. Um, OK, but that's enough. We can look at the surface now. And we can display it in constant color, or we can choose an, um, yeah, a fluid um, property. For example, pressure. So here you can see um, a stagnation point and so on. And investigate the pressure. And here on the bottom, you can see the time steps. Um, and this is what we specified before. So because I chose 
um, for the simulation that every thousand uh, time step will be exported. You can scroll to, uh, through seven steps that will make up the five seconds of simulation time. But I'm not interested in these uh, instantaneous values. Um, I rather want to see the average values. So you can uh, click on the time average pressure and um, adjust the timeline uh, or the legend of the colors. And here you can now see uh, the um, time average values for the pressure, for example. Or you could obviously change it to velocity and so on. OK, and now here you can also um, decide where you want to place another refinement level or maybe increase the refinement level. For example, here, everywhere where there's separation, it's very useful to have more refinements or here on this, um, yeah, on the front of the car. If you want to um, import another section cut, you have to go to, or just another result, again, go to File, Import Results, and choose another section cut, and again, the SOS file. So in this case, this was a section cut through the wheels, the front wheels. So um, it's important for time average values to go to the last time steps, because otherwise you will see the averaging up until, for example, uh, the 2,000th uh, time step. But we want to see the whole range averaged, so you always have to um, set this slider to the last time step. And now we can adjust the legend again. Okay. So here you, see, you can see the velocity around the wheels, for example. Another result that's very uh, useful to look at is obviously the surface of the car, which is in the surface data, again, in the SOS file. Uh, the SOS file essentially combines all these different files, which include the different values for different time steps. And this works just like section cuts. So right click on the object you want to um, want to evaluate. For example, the chassis, edit, and then set it, for example, to time average for shear stress. And again, it doesn't show anything because we're not at the right time step. So let's go to the last one. and automatically adjust the range. Okay, so here you can see the uh, wall shear stress all around the car. Okay, so um, yeah, the next step would be to evaluate this a little bit more in more detail and then decide on the uh, refinement levels Maybe you want to decrease the size of some of them or adjust them a little bit more to the shape of the car, or you want to add more of them, for example, in this area where there's a flow detachment. And then um, I would recommend to compare different results of different simulations and find the best setup where you can trust the results. Um, yeah, and if you want to change anything, for example, if you have uh, um, a side mirror or something, you can just go back into virtual wind tunnel, go to import and import that part, and then um, redefine the offset refinement, and you can just start the simulation again. Or if you have parts that you want to replace, for example, if you have wheels that look a little bit different, you can just click on right click, uh, replace uh, from file or from part, and then it will replace the geometry of that part 
but not change uh, the mesh controls, for example. So that part will be still identified as a wheel and have the refinement levels around it that you defined before. So virtual wind tunnel and ultra fluid X are very fast to pre-process simulations and to adjust simulations um, because there's no need for you to uh, create or to, to, to check the volume mesh around the car, which is a, a lot of time that's used in other solvers. Okay, so that was my demonstration of virtual wind tunnel. Uh, I hope you liked it and I hope you have fun trying it out yourself. And yeah, good luck for you and your teams. Thank <laughs> you.